Wake up, sucker. We're thieves and we're bad guys. That's exactly what we are. We gotta find our own way. In this movie, Brew, we're gonna discuss 1978's Dawn of the Dead. It's primarily starring Ken Forey as Peter, David M.G. as Stephen, Scott Reininger as Roger, Galen Ross as Francine. In 1974, George Romero was invited by friend Mark Mason of Oxford Development Company to visit the Monroeville Mall, located in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, just east of Pittsburgh. It was during this visit where Romero was shown around the mall and got a tour of hidden parts of the mall. Romero took notes of the blank, expressionless faces of the shoppers. Mason made a joke that someone would be able to survive in the mall during an emergency. Romero drew inspiration from this and began on the screenplay for his second of the dead film. Due to the poor box office performance of Martin, Romero was unable to get domestic investors on board with the film, but his fate would have it. Italian horror director Dario Argento heard that Romero was working on a sequel to Night of the Living Dead, a film that Argento was a fan of and early supporter of. Argento wanted to help Romero realize his vision. He met with Romero and his producer, Richard P. Rubenstein, and helped secure financing in exchange for international distribution rights. Argento invited Romero to his home in Rome, Italy, so he would not have the distractions while working on the screenplay, and the two of them could discuss plot developments. Romero finished the screenplay in three weeks and was able to secure the Monroeville Mall and even some additional financing through his connections with the mall's owners, Oxford Development, with shooting set to begin in November of 1977. Romero had wanted unknowns for his film, and went to New York to begin casting with casting director John Amplis. David M.G. was introduced to Romero by owner of the restaurant that M.G. worked at. Romero told him that if he could fit into the coat, he would get the part. M.G. jokingly said that he got the role because the other actor was far too big to wear the coat. Scott Reininger, God, I hope I'm saying that right, also worked at the same restaurant. Though Romero was uncertain about Reininger due to the height differences between him and the already cast Ken Forey. Reininger convinced Romero that once the film got going, nobody was going to care. The scene where Roger and Peter are in the trucks and they're joking around about Roger's height was improvised between the two actors. On November 13th, 1977, shooting at the mall would start at 11 p.m. after the mall closed and would go on until 7 a.m. when the automated music would come on over the PA system and nobody knew how to shut it off. It wasn't always an easy shoot as Pennsylvania can have cold winters, I can attest to that. So there were occasional shooting days where the temperatures reached freezing temps and the set was snowed in at times, which would result in canceled catered lunches. While Romero doesn't like to use storyboards, he often pre-plans how sequences work. And generally, he doesn't go past what he envisions in his head. He had to shoot scenes nearly simultaneously, though, at different locations in the mall due to the strict shooting schedule and the shoestring budget that he was working with. This forced creative compromises, largely due to the technical limitations. This leads to discrepancies between the production draft of the script and the final cut of the film. Romero did film parts of the script that he felt were vital, nearly verbatim to the script though, such as the four main characters clearing out the mall and taking it over. Production shut down for three weeks during the Christmas season so the film crew wouldn't have to deal with all the Christmas decorations. Good thing it was 1977 because they would have had to shut down for three fucking months nowadays. During this break, Romero began editing his existing footage and by the time the filming resumed, Romero had assembled enough of his script on film that he could edit and cut a viable film. This allowed Romero to let some improvisation into the production, developing new ideas such as the biker gang attacking the mall. The Pagans, a local biker gang, were hired by the production to create the gang in the film and the pie fight was improvised too. There's some discrepancy on the origin of the pie fight though. One story is it was improvised on the spot. Another story is that during the scripting of Night of the Living Dead, while Romero and John Russo contemplated how the zombies would be destroyed, Marilyn Eastman had made a joke that they could throw pies at their faces. The biker showing up at the mall was unplanned. Basically, they just started rolling the cameras and told him to drive up to the mall. Most famous among the improvisational nature of this stage is that the uh, Tom Savini character, Blades, and Tazos Stavrakis' Sledge character... Um, with Savini telling Fangoria magazine that everybody was dressing up in costume and stuff, so when it came time for the bikers to come in, Tazo and I said, hey, we can do that. So we dressed ourselves up with bandoliers and swords, and I had all kinds of props with me. 
I became Blades and I had this rubber sledgehammer so Tasso grabbed it and he became Sledge. The airfield scene was filmed at Harold W. Brown Memorial Airfield, also in Monroeville. In the living quarters the characters set up in the mall, along with the elevator shaft, were sets built at Romero's production company, The Layton Image. The gun store was not located at the mall, though. Instead, Firearms Unlimited in East Liberty was used. This store has since closed down, though. Principal photography ended in February 1978, and Romero, who was widely known to be a competent editor, began work on editing the film together. Romero would shoot wide steady shots from many different angles which allowed him to have endless possibilities and choices for how to assemble a sequence depending on what kind of emotional response he was wanting to invoke from the viewer. Changing an angle, deleting or extending a portion of a scene can completely change how the scene plays out, as evident in the numerous cuts of this film. I personally have an old DVD of the Lux box set that has the theatrical cut the Argento cut, and an extended cut, and each cut of the film feels completely different. For the practical effects of the film, Tom Savini was brought in, who was originally supposed to work on Night of the Living Dead, but was drafted into the Vietnam War at the time. It was Savini's experience as a combat photographer in the war that he drew inspiration from for his effects. He wasn't so much creating gruesome and gory images as he was creating what he witnessed overseas during the war. He originally designed the makeup for the zombies to be gray, as that was the intended look of the zombies in Night of the Living Dead. He later said that this was a mistake, as the makeup appears blue in the film. Savini sculpted scars and bite wounds on the plastic photographic developing trays, where he would then pour hydrocol over it to create negative molds, or as Savini called them, the slab of wounds. Foam latex would be poured into the slab and the excess scraped away before being baked in an oven. This would have the latex appliances ready to go in a few hours. This method was used as they would need to have appliances ready to go on any given night of the shoot, and Savini did try to keep a variety amongst the undead hordes, though, ensuring that they looked like recently reanimated corpses. Some would be accident victims, cancer patients, or some would be done up like they were recently taken care of by an undertaker. Savini was not a fan of the 3M stage blood formula. He didn't like how it showed up on the film as an almost magenta tempura paint. Romero, however, was not bothered by this as he felt that it only added to the film's comic book over-the-top style of production. In the original ending of the film, Francine and Peter were to kill themselves. Peter was going to shoot himself in the head and Francine would stick her head into the path of the rotating helicopter blades. During production, though, this was changed to the ending we got in the finished film. And there was some lead-up to this in the finished film, but both characters ended up surviving. The helicopter gag, however, was used towards the beginning of the film when a zombie approaches the helicopter while Roger is refueling it, and it has the top of its head cut off. The prop of Francine's head was painted and done up to resemble an African-American man and used in the beginning of the film. And I could easily make a whole video on just the practical effects that Savini did for this film, so while I'm kind of glossing over it here, if you're interested in this sort of thing, I highly suggest searching out the numerous documentaries that exist on this element of the film, or if there's enough interest, I can just make a separate video. The MPAA came down hard on this movie when Romero first sought out an R rating only to be disappointed when he found out that the MPA was going to issue an X rating. And we seen a pattern here yet? The stigma at the time was that the X rating was generally associated with pornography, so a movie like Dawn of the Dead getting an X rating was a death sentence, as it would be blocked from release in most mainstream theaters. Romero believed cutting the film to appease the MPA would ruin the film. Laurel Entertainment planned to release the film with the warning there is no explicit sex in this picture, however there are scenes of violence that may be considered shocking. No one under 17 will be admitted. Distributors still balked at the film, wanting it to be edited to get an R rating. Richard Rubenstein arranged for an advanced screening of a rough cut of the film to be released in New York to prove Romero's point, that the film would be viable. The film did well and the response was approving, proving that Dawn of the Dead would have an audience. United Film Distribution Company was on board, but there were still challenges with an unrated film release. Ads could not be run on TV before 11 p.m. in some states, and some newspapers couldn't run ads in the paper for the film. The film did well at the box office, raking in 55 million worldwide, 
but it was home video where it really found its footing. The film begins with a society that is collapsing under the disorder and chaos caused by the dead reanimating. Despite the best efforts of the military, the undead menace has spread, and within three weeks of the beginning of the outbreak, millions of people have been killed and reanimated. Some rural communities and the National Guard have been effective in the open country, but urban areas have been basically overrun. A local television studio, WGON, in Philadelphia is a mess of confusion. But Stephen Andrews and Francine Parker are planning on stealing the station's traffic helicopter to escape. We cut to a SWAT team led by Roger DeMarco raiding a housing project where the tenants are not following the martial law of delivering their dead to the National Guardsmen. Some of the civilians fight back with handguns and rifles. They're killed by both the SWAT and their own dead who have reanimated. During this raid, Roger meets Peter Washington, who is from another team. They partner up and Roger tells Peter that his friend Stephen is going to steal the news helicopter and flee. Roger suggested Peter join them. They were radioed about a group of reanimated dead in the basement and they go to deal with them. Why do these people keep them here? Because they still believe there's respect in dying. Afterwards, Peter and Roger rendezvous with Francine and Stephen and leave Philadelphia in the helicopter. They stop for fuel and have some close encounters. And in a scene that shows how widespread and uncompromising the problem is with the dead reanimating, Peter has to deal with two children who have been killed and reanimated. It's not graphic, but it's still chilling and showing how this can and will affect anybody and everybody. With the helicopter refueled, the group takes off and eventually happens upon a shopping mall. After flying over it a bit, they decide to land and make this their new home. They plan how to fortify it by using trucks to block off the entrances to keep the dead outside and from breaking through. Peter and Steven come up with building a wooden barrier to cover the stairwell they use to access the mall from where they set up their living quarters. While Roger and Peter are getting the trucks and parking them in front of the entrances, Roger becomes reckless and when returning to a parked truck to retrieve his pack that he has dropped, he gets bitten in the ensuing chaos. They proceed to clear out the inside of the mall, removing the ghouls that have been trapped inside. After this, they settle down and furnish their makeshift apartment and live comfortably due to the mall's goods that are available to them. Roger eventually dies from his wounds with Peter watching over him. As soon as he reanimates, Peter proceeds to shoot him in the head. This is not the Republicans versus the Democrats. They've got us in the hole, economically, or we're in another war. It's more crucial than that we are down to the line, folks. We are down to the line. There are no divisions among, among living Please. society. Please. At least we, let him finish. Let us move. It's really all over, isn't it? Quiet. Unemotional. Several months later, there are no more emergency broadcast transmissions, which suggests that either the government has collapsed completely or the population has been killed and reanimated leaving nobody left. Francine is now visibly pregnant and presses the others that they should be prepared to leave the mall in the case of an emergency. They load ammo and other supplies into the helicopter with Stephen teaching her how to fly it. A motorcycle gang, having seen the helicopter during one of Francine's lessons, arrives to take the mall, destroying the barriers in the process which allows hundreds of undead into the mall. Peter and Stephen try locking the gates to prevent looting, but the bikers piss Stephen off and he gets into a gun battle with them. Peter and Stephen go to flee back to the apartment, but Stephen is shot in the arm as he tries to escape through the elevator shaft. Injured, he is cornered by the undead in the elevator and gets bitten multiple times. Bikers, Peter shot are consumed by the zombies and those that survived retreat with the supplies that they've stolen. Stephen reanimates and is by far the best looking zombie in the movie. And just seeing how he walks with that limp and his ankle turned and that makes my ankle hurt just watching it. After Stephen is reanimated, 
He acts on remnants of his former memories and proceeds towards the living quarters and tears down the false wall, leading the undead horde to Peter and Francine. As Stephen enters, Peter shoots him in the head and tells Francine to go, that he's staying. So she heads for the roof, and Peter locks himself in a room, contemplating suicide. When the horde busts into the room, Peter decides to fight, shooting the first undead to walk into the room and fighting his way to the ladder. He eventually makes it to the roof and joins Francine in the helicopter where they fly away to an uncertain future. And that was George Romero's Dawn of the Dead. While I really enjoy this movie, I kind of flip-flop on what cut of the film I prefer. Depends on the mood, really. Romero's cut sometimes feels like certain parts are get a little long in the tooth and the point can be reached more quickly. Argento's cut is more concise and doesn't lose the meaning behind the film. Yes, it is more action-focused than Romero's cut but you still get the larger picture that Romero is trying to paint without the brushstrokes going outside the lines. Both cuts have their place, and both cuts should be viewed if you haven't seen one or the other, depending on what country you live in. And really, at this point, I mean, who hasn't seen Dawn of the Dead? The characters can come off one-dimensional. They're self-serving people looking out for themselves, have no issues with acting in depraved and barbaric ways for self-preservation. Some claim this makes the characters hard to root for or unlikable. I feel this makes them human. Yes, they're behavior is basically a plot device to show that humans can act in barbaric and depraved ways out of choice, whereas the zombies are just barbaric due to their nature. The social commentary about American consumerism is strong and is basically what the film is known for. But is there more to it than that? Yes, I think there is. I mean, beneath the zombie headshots and the humans being ripped apart and devoured, we are offered an interesting take on how some people would react to an apocalyptic event like this. You may not agree with the characters and how they behave, but you can't say that nobody would ever have behaved in this way in this type of situation. While parts of the movie can come off as mundane, these people's lives would have moments that are mundane. You couldn't get away with a film that has such a slow burn in it at times in modern cinema. Just look at how the remake handled the survivors getting accustomed to living in the mall. What makes Dawn of the Dead appealing is that this is a movie about people. They're just doing what they feel they need to do to survive. There is no overarching plot about trying to end the epidemic. The story is small and personal. The characters are isolated, so the story is isolated. Some of the acting can be a little stiff, yes, but and some of the stunts just didn't really age well. And some of the effects are kind of goofy compared to what's out there now, but overall Savini's work on the effects for this movie is still a masterclass in gore and makeup. Romero's film here has a strong following with at least three different cuts of the film out there. There's basically a version of it that just about anybody can enjoy. And like I said, while I enjoy each cut for different reasons, this movie is fantastic. And out of the three of the Dead films that started Romero's series, this is second only to Day of the Dead for me. Unfortunately, we haven't gotten a Blu-ray release that's on par with Anchor Bay's 2004 Ultimate Edition box set that I mentioned earlier. But you can't go wrong with picking this movie up in some form or another. I highly recommend you see this film if you haven't seen it yet for some unknown reason. And especially if your only experience with Dawn of the Dead is Zack Snyder's remake, then definitely do yourself a favor and watch this 1978 original. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth.